Do you know what a plexus is? A plexus is like a tangle of nerves. There aren't any connections there. It's just like a tangle of cables that have made a mess underneath your desk. Uh, so the celiac plexus, it's in here. It also gets called the solar plexus, which we might talk about the whys and the anatomies of as well. But the celiac plexus, where is it? What's its anatomy? What does it do? What's it good for? Does it have any clinical relevance other than the obvious thing of, well, it makes my body work normally? Um, let's have a look at the anatomy of this celiac plexus. Well, let's swap you out because you've just got bony bits for you who've got more useful bits. Let's remove the liver, the stomach, the transverse colon, and then we take out the small bowel, and here's the pancreas, there's the duodenum, more large bowel. We take all of that out. The purpose of doing that was to show you how posterior we've got. So we're now in the posterior abdomen. Here's the diaphragm here. That is the aorta. We see the aorta here. So the aorta descends through the thorax, passes through the diaphragm. Really, it sneaks down the back of the diaphragm. And as the aorta appears, from the diaphragm, we see this first anterior branch here. And this first anterior branch of the aorta is also known as the celiac trunk. And this celiac trunk will give off a number of branches and will supply blood to structures of the embryonic foregut. We mean esophagus, stomach, liver, pancreas, half a duodenum, stuff up here, the foregut, the gut that's up there, right? So the celiac trunk tells us where we're gonna find the celiac plexus. Yeah, the, the aorta here is covered by a plexus of nerves, like a, a tangle of wires, and also some ganglia, the celiac ganglia are here. Now a ganglion is different to a plexus because a ganglion is like a, a soft lump it's a collection of nerve cell bodies, and then they send their axons off from there. But where we find those nerve cell bodies, we see connections. We don't see connections in a plexus, that's just disorganized wiring, that's just cables running all over the place. But the ganglion, we see connections. Okay, so what sort of nerves have we got here? These arteries are largely gonna supply structures of the gastrointestinal tract, organs, viscera. So the nerves that supply the gastrointestinal tract are going to be uh, autonomic. We have uh, two divisions of nerves to start with. We have somatic, innervating skeletal muscle and skin, things we can move, move and things that we're aware of. And then we have autonomic nerves, which look after things that we're not aware of. The autonomic nervous system has sympathetic nerves and parasympathetic nerves, those are innovating smooth muscle, so they're driving things, for example, the peristalsis of moving the contents of the gastrointestinal tract along the tube. And also we have sensory information passing from the organs, from the viscera, uh, and those are called visceral afferents. So they're also gonna be found here. So those are the types of nerves that are here, nerves that are gonna innovate the gastrointestinal tract. The reason they're associated with the arteries is that this artery is gonna branch and run to the parts of the gastrointestinal tract. Hey, if an artery is going there already, you might as well send the nerves down the same route, right? So we find the arteries covered with the nerves. And down here, this is the superior mesenteric artery, and that celiac plexus continues down here as a superior mesenteric plexus, and that this superior mesenteric artery will go on and for, uh, supply blood to the small intestine and other bits. And that's super complicated. There are loads of branches. So the nerves follow the same routes, so they get everywhere. Where do those sympathetic nerves come from. Here, we're looking at the posterior neck, posterior thoracic wall, posterior abdomen. Here's the spinal cord. And these here alongside, these are the sympathetic trunk, the sympathetic chain, the sympathetic ganglia. Sympathetic nerves come out of the spinal cord at thoracic spinal levels, mostly. And they send a preganglionic 
sympathetic neuron out, which may pass to the sympathetic ganglion at the same level, or might go up or down to a different level. And then they synapse with a postganglionic sympathetic neuron, which runs off to its target organ, which could be a blood vessel in your big toe. Now, in the case of the celiac plexus, what, we, what actually happens is we have preganglionic sympathetic neurons leaving the spinal cord coming together to form splanchnic nerves, nerves that pass from the thorax to the abdomen, and they pass to the celiac plexus and the celiac ganglion. And those preganglionic sympathetic neurons run to the ganglion, the celiac ganglion, and synapse with postganglionic sympathetic neurons, which then run off to the target organs. It's just a thing, is that there's a two neuron chain. You have one neuron and then a second neuron, and then they go to their target organ. We see that with sympathetic nerves and we see that with parasympathetic nerves. So that's where the sympathetic nerves come from. Where do the parasympathetic nerves come from? That's right, it's the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is a cranial nerve. It comes out of the brain stem. It's cranial nerve 10, runs down the neck, dives down to find the esophagus, runs with the esophagus through the diaphragm, and look, that puts it in just the right place down here. So there's the esophagus, there's the celiac plexus location here, and the vagus nerve, there's a left and a right one on either side, and as they come into the abdomen, the stomach has rotated in the embryo, so we get an anterior trunk and a posterior trunk. So those two vagus nerves will both contribute to the celiac plexus. So the celiac plexus has sympathetic nerves and parasympathetic nerves in it. What about those sensory nerves, those visceral afferents that are running back to the central nervous system? Well, they will follow the sympathetic nerves up the same route. They will run with the vagus nerve as well. They are different nerves doing a different job, but they'll go with the other nerves to get back to the spinal cord or the brainstem to give that sensory information to the brain so the brain can do whatever it thinks is appropriate with that information. So what structures are supplied by the celiac plexus? Well, um, celiac trunk, we think foregut. So nerves of the celiac plexus will travel to and from the esophagus, the stomach, uh, the half the duodenum, the pancreas, the spleen, the liver, the gallbladder, and also look at what's nearby. These are the adrenal glands, these are the kidneys, and down here there is also um, an aorticorenal plexus, which is going to send nerves to the, the kidneys. So those get involved as well. Now I said that the superior mesenteric plexus is a continuation of the celiac plexus. So those nerves continue down the aorta and then they will follow the superior mesenteric artery out to those structures. So the superior mesenteric plexus and the celiac plexus by continuation will supply the rest of the duodenum, more pancreas, the entire small intestine, the ascending colon, and then the transverse colon about two thirds of the way across. So the gastrointestinal tract, it kind of has its own brain, the enteric nervous system, but these nerves sending information to the brain, taking motor information from the brain have an effect on the structures of the gastrointestinal tract. And it's the celiac plexus, which is kind of like not a coordinating centre, but kind of like, um, it's like a focal point from which those nerves can spread out into all of those complicated organs because it's a very long gastrointestinal tract. What about that solar plexus idea then? You might have heard that a blow to the solar plexus can be debilitating. Is that what we're talking about? Well, yes. So... What we see, because we have the, the celiac trunk here, you might see the fibres radiating out from the celiac plexus, a bit like the sun, the rays of the sun. So it gets called the solar plexus. But a blow to the abdomen at this region here isn't probably, hopefully, um, damaging or crushing or uh, hurting these nerves. 
really, look, we've got the diaphragm here. The diaphragm is there. Really what you're doing is you're um, landing a blow to other structures. The diaphragm goes into spasm, which makes it very difficult to breathe. <laughs> and you have been winded. That's why it's debilitating. So this is kind of a coincidence, I think. Okay, what's the clinical relevance of all this? Well, for one, this is important anatomy that lets your body work normally, as I said earlier, but you could block the nerves here. That is, you could apply anesthetic to them or even um, sever the nerves if you wanted to stop pain from organs passing to the central nervous system. And that's obviously a pretty extreme thing to do. To get to this point, you would go in that away. So why would you do this? Well, really we're thinking about um, patients that have a, a cancer in an abdominal organ and that cancer is terminal. They're receiving palliative care now and the pain uh, medication is not managing their pain effectively enough. So this would be a method of managing that pain. It's not common, but it's a thing and it's uh, uh, an interesting and useful bit of anatomy to be aware of. Okay, the anatomy of the celiac plexus. See you next week.